think Bitcoin has been so successful. So we'll call this the Bitcoin model. And I'm going to make the case to you that there are four critical pieces that make up the Bitcoin model. The first of which is Bitcoin is not a company. And as such, it doesn't really have a central point of failure. Right? Bitcoin is an open source protocol. And I think that's really critical for its success. The second part is the fact that it has this token attached to this open source protocol, that the token can monetize essentially the program itself. Meaning that when people use Bitcoin, they're increasing the value of the Bitcoin network. Because we know there's a fixed supply of Bitcoin, as demand increases, that drives up the price of the Bitcoin token. So you have to have an open source project, and you have to have a token to monetize that open source project. But the third ingredient is really important. You need a decentralized blockchain to store all these records. And that removes another block and removes another bottleneck of the system. Because if any node goes off the system, Bitcoin keeps working. It's a global network, and all the records are decentralized throughout all of the nodes. The fourth thing that's made Bitcoin successful is it's the first successful implementation of a consensus mechanism known as proof of work. So by using proof of work, Bitcoin is able to establish the state of those records and all the nodes are able to agree amongst themselves on what those records represent. So those are the four things I want to talk about today. Open source, token attached, has a consensus mechanism, and stores its records globally in a Bitcoin-type blockchain. Now, here's the thing you probably haven't heard before, or you may not have heard before, is I think this model can be applied to things that aren't payment networks, that aren't currencies. I don't think Bitcoin is this unique aberration. I think it's the first successful demonstration of this new way to build technology. And so let me give you one simple example. There are probably three or four projects now working on decentralizing data storage. Meaning, instead of using Dropbox, I can store my files on the cloud, and this cloud is made up of everybody that contributed extra storage space from their hard drive. Now that's a really exciting idea, and I think the way to implement that is to use the Bitcoin model. So don't make another Dropbox. So make just a Dropbox that accepts Bitcoin. That's not really interesting, right? A little on my background, I run the BitAngels. We invested about $7 million last year into 12 different startups. And when people come to me and say, hey, I want to build Dropbox, and I'm going to attach Bitcoin, and you can pay in Bitcoin, that's not interesting at all. The reason is, as soon as Dropbox starts taking Bitcoin, your competitive advantage completely disappears, right? You now have... No advantage over Dropbox. Dropbox still has a huge network of people, and they have the network effect. But if you said to me, I'm going to disrupt Dropbox by creating this open source protocol that issues a token to everybody that loads more hard drive space onto this network, and that's going to have a cost a tenth of what Dropbox charges. Now that's really interesting. So one of our teams at the Hackathon, uh, the Bit Angels is the primary sponsor of the Hackathon at the event today, we put up about a million dollars in prizes for the top teams that uh, participate. And one of the teams is doing just that. It's called the Storage Project, and they're rewarding people with a token for adding extra storage space to the network. That's a really exciting project. And so, what I'm theorizing here is that we're going to see that model get used more and more. So it's not just currency, it's not just payments, it's not just storage. You can look at the technology stack of the internet and you can apply this model fairly generally to projects that have a strong network effect. So let me give you another example I want to talk about. Uh, quick show of hands, who's familiar with mesh networks for internet access? About half the folks? Okay, good. So for those not familiar, mesh network is basically a way for me to share the internet from my device to your device. So I can share it from my phone to your phone, share it from my router to your phone. 
why hasn't this technology caught on? It's really interesting. The technology all works, but there's no incentive for me to share my internet with Nikos. So people don't do it. There are great projects like Open Garden, for example, that have almost a million users. But most of those users are sharing the internet with their own devices at their own home. There's not yet an incentive that says, I'm going to go set up a router and get paid to do that by sharing the internet. But that's what we're about to see. Uh, we're partnering with Open Garden, uh, the BitAngels Fund, to issue a token and reward people for adding bandwidth to the network. So the reason that's really exciting is imagine what's happened already with Bitcoin. You had hobbyists that started just with CPUs on their own personal computers, and they began adding computational power to the Bitcoin network. And then everybody raided Best Buy, bought all the GPUs from the gamers, and used those more powerful hardware to mine Bitcoin. And then the professionals came along and said, we can spend tens of millions of dollars and build application-specific integrated circuits, meaning chips that do nothing but mine Bitcoin. And each time we saw this generational change, you had a 50x increase in the amount of computational power being added to the network from CPUs to GPUs to ASICs. Now, here's the amazing thing. I don't think Bitcoin is the only time we can do that. So go back to our mesh network example. I think it'll start with hobbyists, just like it did with Bitcoin. Guys will set up routers in busy places and it'll share traffic and people will be rewarded, let's call it mesh coin. And they'll earn these mesh coins by sharing the internet. People will have to buy these coins in order to access the internet. And of course, this will all be done behind the scenes. Users won't have to worry about all that or even understand all that. This will happen in the back end. They'll just know that if they want access, they subscribe to this little service and when they're around these little hotspots, they can access the internet for really, really cheap. So that's really exciting, but what's more exciting is I think we can go through the same evolution we saw with mining with something like mesh networks. So it'll start with people setting up personal routers, then you'll have people going around setting up trucks and mobile spots and small towers until I think three or four years from now, we'll get to a point where professional companies are spending tens of millions of dollars to do stuff that is entirely focused on sharing the internet. That's really the power I want to unlock, is this new model for building technology. So we talked about storage. I think it'll be the same thing. People will add their own CPU uh, or extra hard drive storage sitting on their desktop. Then everybody will go raid Best Buy again and buy a bunch of three terabyte hard drives and add that. And then professionals will get in. They'll start adding entire databases, entire uh, data centers worth of space to this kind of system. Because basically what we're talking about is an extension of the share economy, right? That's really what gets me excited is we have all these unused resources just laying around. I look at the highway and there are a bunch of empty cars spending gasoline and money and energy going back and forth. Mostly empty, right? They've got maybe one or two passengers and maybe they have four or five seats, right? They're using 25% of their capacity. But now that we have a way to reward people monetarily, we can do it directly from person to person. There doesn't have to be any taxi company or intermediary between us. We've seen exciting share applications like Uber on Sidecar and things like that come up where people can share their car, get paid for it, the app does all the work. You don't even have to pay the person. The app takes care of everything. You just push a button at the end to give them a rating. That's really exciting. But I think Bitcoin is going to accelerate this trend because now we have the monetary way to do this that's really frictionless. And we're also removing the idea that you need a company to provide that service. We can build a protocol that provides that service and people can build cool services on top of that protocol. So I know this is a sort of a really wide-ranging vision, but I think most people overestimate how long this is going to take. Some people think this is going to be four or five years from now. I'm telling you, 2014, we're going to see the first iteration of decentralization of all the major parts of the technology stack. 
the first project that gets paid to share your data, the first project that get paid to share your storage space, the first project to share your internet. Another project I'm really excited about, uh, quick show of hands, who is familiar with the Tor project? Anonymous browsing, okay, about half. It's really, really an important tool for the developing world uh, where you have a lot of censorship from governments. But the Tor network is small and it's immature. It's run by hobbyists that nobly dedicate their hardware just because they believe in the cause. There are about 2,500 nodes and it routes traffic for millions of users. But in order for Tor to really scale and succeed, I believe that they need a incentive in order to reward people for running a Tor node. Then all of a sudden, entrepreneurs are running around the globe setting up nodes to provide internet access to everybody in the world um, and provide it in a way where they can have privacy of what websites they're looking at. And so at the hackathon, some of the world's leading experts in Tor have been working the last few days and they've come up with a really exciting system for how we decentralize that. So you think about browsing, you think about storage, you think about data, you think about mesh, and providing the internet. We're really taking the whole existing internet stack and finding ways to decentralize it. That really gets me excited, gets me passionate. Um, I spend 80, 90 hours a week now running the BitAngels Fund, and this is all we do. We've just closed our round and making the announcement here at the Austin conference that we have $15 million to invest in decentralized applications. That is, people using this Bitcoin model to decentralize different services. So I really want to make this an interactive discussion. So I believe we have a mic, and we have a good 20 minutes or so for questions. So I'd love to dig in with you guys. We've got a small enough crowd, really just make it, you know, feel free to ask whatever you want. Happy to dig into the details and really sort of explore this idea with you guys. David, I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, of course, the ideas, but I'm very interested also in decentralizing things that are a little bit harder to measure. For instance, decentralizing education, mm. having people contributing to educational material and people maybe consuming educational materials. It's a little harder to measure educational outcomes compared to uh, gigabytes or uh, megabits of uh, transfer or distances in, uh, in a you know, in a car. What are your thoughts about this? How can uh, one decentralize harder to measure activities like education? Thanks for the question, Nikos. For anybody that didn't hear, um, the question was, how do we decentralize higher order things, tougher things like education? I'll actually make an introduction to you um, with an African group that's working on exactly that. Um, really at the core of any of these proposals is the really tough question that you have to solve. How do you prove something happened? In the case of Bitcoin, they're proving a very simple thing. Well, we take it for granted it's simple now. Nobody had solved it before 2008. But they were able to prove that uh, my computer did this amount of work and contributed that hashing power to the Bitcoin network. Right? So that's the most basic proof of work consensus model that's been come up with. And so now people are trying to do more advanced consensus models and proofs. So in the case I talked about uh, bandwidth, I talked about compute, I talked about storage, that's all part of a new proposal that's coming out uh, in the next few weeks from uh, MadeSafe. I think they'll officially launch in, in April uh, with their proposal. But they're, they've got something they're calling proof of resource. So they're able to look and prove whether a computer has provided storage or bandwidth or compute. And so that's a really exciting idea because it provides the underlying fundamentals you know, to make those kind of projects possible. What you're describing is even more difficult because it's got a lot more human elements in it. How do you measure the amount somebody learns or the amount somebody reads? There's an ambitious African project I'll introduce you to um, that is, is trying to take a crack at that problem. And uh, if you're interested in that, um, maybe you can contribute to what they're doing. But I think that'll take a bit longer, but it, it really is interesting to see if that's possible. I just wanted to, to share my idea about this. I think sure. a, a layer of uh, human humans who could review one's uh, work or one's learning 
could be one way to crack that question. So it's much more complicated, much more convoluted, many more layers. But if there is someone who can test the, my knowledge on a certain subject, and then someone who tests whether that person can test me on that knowledge, uh, up to a certain level, of course, would be one way to do that. And I'd love to hear your opinion it's, about it. It's a cool proposal, and I think we're going to see more and more creative things like that coming out. So other questions? Yes, sir. Gosh, you must be in a fascinating uh, vantage point because all of these people are coming to you with their ideas, and so you're able to literally sift through all these ideas. Um, man, and it seems like it's only limited by the, the human imagination to apply this new technology. So how, right. do, you, how do you um, ground yourself to make sure to, to guarantee success in this, in this realm and how do you know you're doing a good job of it? So I don't think I can necessarily uh, guarantee success, but my best answer is I'm focused on the fundamental things that I absolutely can prove. So we're still at the early days where we're talking about infrastructure level projects, things that can be quantified very clearly. Um, and I think we can use that as a base to build more advanced things. But right now, I'm focused at the bottom of the value chain. How do we do the most basic infrastructure um, and get that solved? And so that's sort of my approach. I read a lot of white papers. I talk to a lot of technical experts. And there's no really other substitute for it. You have to go and meet those guys. And you'll find out very quickly which projects are sort of vaporware and which projects have really spent a lot of time thinking through the different edge cases. Ultimately, the test is when it goes live in the wild and people are going to test it and people are going to try to break it and people are going to try to attack it. And that's sort of the confidence that Bitcoin has built in the community because it's been five years and it's been able to stand up against everybody's attacks. And so it's really gonna, it's gonna be interesting as people like do different experiments. Um, I, I ultimately want to bet on the teams that have the technical experience. And even if there's a problem, there's always bugs, there's always problems that they can overcome those, that they can fix those and come up with creative solutions. So that's sort of the best answer I have for how do you find those guys. Okay, and, um, my other question is, uh, what is the optimal investor for someone like your organization? So just to make clear, um, there are two organizations. Um, most people are probably familiar with the BitAngels Network, which is the group of individual uh, angel investors. These are people that want to contribute Bitcoin to Bitcoin startups. And that's been operating the last uh, nine plus months since last May. We launched at the San Jose Bitcoin Conference uh, last May. And so they're interested in anything that builds up the Bitcoin ecosystem. Separate from that is the fund. And we just have a really small group, six or seven uh, limited partners, uh, myself included, that have put in their Bitcoins, put in their master coins, their different cryptocurrencies, and said, we want to reinvest in this model of decentralized applications. And so each group has a different focus. The BitAngels Network is really focused on those individual investments in traditional startups. And the fund is really focused on uh, this more advanced stuff. Yes, sir. Hey, David, I'd, I'd like to um, hear what you've come across as far as the things that have most interested you in as far as microfunding. Because, uh, okay. because of, like this conversation over here with Stefan and Jeffrey Tucker, I could just see a whole audience grow around this and we could all be <laughs> microfunding it. And then at the end of the conversation, we could all have an inventory of who microfunded it and then when. And oh, this, my, when I got excited about this part of the conversation, he got excited about this part of the conversation, we could see that whole growth dynamic. And I'm just kind of interested from your vantage point, what you've really heard interesting things about microfunding. So I'll just talk about one particular example, if that's all right. Um, microfunding is interesting around content. So quick show of hands, who has read the novel Snow Crash? One, two, three, four, five, few people. OK, so in the novel, there is a proposal for a decentralized way to compensate people for putting up cool news stories, cool footage, like the first guy that walks in and uh, there's been you know, some big event and he captures video of it. That video is valuable, right? And how do you compensate somebody for that? So I've seen two or three groups that have made proposals for how do we reward people for providing that content? It seems like you have to implement a sort of system where um, 
you need the buyer of that content at one end, and you need to be able to connect the creator of that content at the other end, and you have to have a provable way that the buyer has confirmed payment before that data is released to the person that's buying it. And so it's sort of a multi-transaction uh, multi type of escrow system you have to put in place. It's, it's a little more of a complicated uh, approach. It's not sort of one of those low-level, straightforward solutions. So it's going to take a bit longer. But I think we are going to see those type of things, maybe not uh, early this year, maybe late this year or next year, there are going to be different projects that uh, attempt to do that. So it really will be interesting because I, I agree, there's an opportunity in this frictionless world where I can move money around and I can ward very specific things uh, for micro payments in content. So thank you. Yes, sir. Companies you're talking about supporting that are decentralized. Like, what are you seeing for the monetization capabilities of those companies, and what's the best practice or you know best kind of company you're looking for there? Sure. Um, the, first, I want to I want to clarify and I want to really emphasize this point. There is no company. There are no shares. There are no employees. It's not incorporated. It's like saying who's the CEO of Bitcoin, right? The media is always sort of getting that wrong. They're looking for a central point. It's like asking who's the CEO of the internet. I'm looking for projects that really emulate Bitcoin in that same way where there's no center. And so the way you monetize those projects is just how Bitcoin is monetized, that type of model. It's an open source network. So anybody can fork it. But why are the alternative coins worth substantially less than Bitcoin? The answer is the network effect. I could make a fork of, Bit I could make a fork of Bitcoin tomorrow, like just pushing one button. There's a website, CoinGen, that just put one button, I can create an alternative coin. But my network effect is one person. I can send to myself and nobody else, right? Because I can't use David tokens on the Bitcoin network. So Bitcoin's value and the way it monetizes is the network only works in conjunction with the Bitcoin tokens. And you can emulate that with all these other systems. So if you wanna take up storage space, on storage network, you have to have storage coin. And so by creating a limited number of those storage coins, you set supply, and then as more and more people use storage coin in order to access this information, the price of the coin increases, and that's the monetization. So I want to participate at the earliest possible point. I want to get in when Bitcoin is $10, not when it's $500 even though I think we're still in the very early days of Bitcoin. I just use it as an example. I want to get involved when master coins are a dollar, and then you know, it goes to $30 or $50. That's really the model. So it's open source, so anybody can make a copy. But if you're the first mover, if you've got the network effect, if you're building up more and more people that are building their infrastructure on top of this system, they have to use your token. And if they fork it, it's now incompatible with your system. So the monetization is entirely in the token. There's no fees or Bitcoin has fees, but it's just enough to prevent people from spamming the network, right? It's just sort of dust level fees. So I, th I think you can really do that, same thing. Other questions? Yes, right over here. So you're talking about new yep, sorry, you're talking about new ventures that are using a decentralized process and using something similar to the blockchain to verify everything. Mm -hmm. How do you get people to support that network to join in and run the nodes without necessarily participating in it and earning those tokens? How do you get them to verify everything? Who's verifying the blockchain? So this is a really good question. This is a question around who adds the value to these new systems. And I think the answer is it's not just one group, it's multiple groups. I'm encouraging groups right now to look at three different pools. Bitcoin only rewards, rewards two things, finding a new block with the block reward, and it rewards transactions. So it's very minor centric, which is fine. It's worked very well. People have adopted Bitcoin. Uh, it's become very successful. But I think it's also room for models where you reward developers for contributing open source code to the protocol itself. So you have an open bounty system, 
Anybody can suggest bounties. The community can vote. There's a certain number of tokens that have been allocated according to an algorithm for rewarding those developers that make those contributions. So there's rewarding the developer community for doing what they do. There's rewarding the folks that support the project early on. And so I call that the Kickstarter style reward. I'm not talking about using the actual website. I'm talking about putting up a Bitcoin address and saying, everybody that supports the features we're building, we want you to send Bitcoins to this address and we'll generate you so many of the storage coins, for example, uh, for everybody that supports it at this early stage. And then you can use those funds to build the actual implementation. The third group that's the most important are the actual users of the system or whoever's providing the primary value. In this case, uh, the example of storage coin, it's the people actually providing the storage. So imagine you could mine storage coins by providing more and more hard drive space to the network. And so everybody's competing to provide more storage space to the network and earning those coins in that way. So I think that ought to be the largest pool. And so you can do it different ways. I don't think there's a perfect answer yet. Best practices are really starting to emerge, but those are the three groups that I think of. The user behavior you need, the developers you want to reward, and the early adopters that you want to support it financially. Yes, sir. Uh, we often, I often hear you talk about how these are decentralized uh, forms of development, but uh, MasterCoin is, is very instructive in this respect. Um, you have uh, core set developers, you have um, Ron Gross, the executive director, and every time I talk to Ron, he's telling me how much difficulty he's having in getting new devs and basically employing people. And so what I see is that in essence, the model very similarly um, mirrors what we would see with any startup, um, which had released open source technology. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. I think part of the answer is these are really immature systems, and they're not as decentralized as we would like. So what happened in the case of MasterCoin is it ran a Kickstarter. Anybody could contribute to the Kickstarter, whoever could contributed, participated, and generated those first tokens for the system. And it was widely talked about, and it held about 30-day period, and that's when the tokens were generated. They also set aside, as you mentioned, a 10% developer pool. And it's controlled by an algorithm. Half of the developer tokens go out the first year, quarter the second year, so on and so forth, according to that algorithm. But we don't have all the pieces yet to take, OK, we have this developer pool. How do we give it out? And there's actually a group at the hackathon helping us solve one of those core problems, which is the bounty pool. Right now, what we ended up doing was we don't want one person to making these decisions. And so we took the people that had most heavily supported the project from the Kickstarter. They volunteered to join a board. We formed a nonprofit foundation. There's actually multiple foundations. There's one in China. There's one in New York. There's a few in Europe. But we formed the first MasterCoin Foundation simply to how do we distribute all these funds that we raised from the Kickstarter, and how do we give out these developer tokens that are set aside every month and should be given out according to the algorithm? So the answer is, we're going to decentralize that piece by piece. The next step is the bounty system. Right now, people propose bounties, and somebody has to decide if it's a good bounty. But you could take the actual coins, you could use MasterCoins, all the holders of MasterCoin could vote by moving their coins from one address to another to prove they own those coins from one of their addresses to another of their addresses, they could vote with those tokens and say, I think that's the most important bounty. And you could tally up all the votes. And you could say 75% of the people in the MasterCoin community believe that's the top priority. We should be moving most of the funds or a proportional amount of those funds to that particular bounty. And so that's the proposal that's out there right now because I think the goal ought to be to remove the foundation entirely. You don't want a foundation. The foundation doesn't want to do all these activities. We're perfectly happy to have the community say, these are the things we want, these are the votes we've taken, and when that code is actually merged in and accepted by the consensus of the community, then it's rewarded. Um, and so I think that bounty system is gonna be really important. There are two points of centralization right now. It's the bounty system, and it's the consensus for the new versions of the software, right? Because in Bitcoin, when a new version of software is proposed, all the miners have to move to that new version or there's a hard fork, right? There's no other option. 
Either you move to that new version and you're complying with the new standards or there is a hard fork. And so the core devs have to do a lot of work to sell the community on this new version is an improvement and not a detriment to what we've already got. And so I think we can emulate that with MasterCoin and these other projects by having that same proof of stake vote and say, look, here's the newest client. Do we have consensus from the community that this is the right move and this is the right direction? And the same thing, people have to download that new client Otherwise, they won't be in compliance and you'll have a fork of the software. And so I think we can get there. We're not there yet, but that's definitely the goal. Other questions? Yes, sir. Hold on. One what, what do I do with the storage coin again? And also the developer coin token? Sure. Um, so when I talked about these different pools of developer coins or Kickstarter coins or um, user behavior coins, it's important to note that these would all be fungible. They're all really the same token. They're all, you know, storage coin, um, and they're interoperable. It's really we're just dividing them into different pots, into different pools, right, and we're distributing them. So for MasterCoin, there's the MasterCoins that were issued during the uh, Kickstarter, and there are dev master coins that are issued as part of this ongoing process of people contributing to open source. Well, they're the same token, they're interoperable, there's no price difference, there's no functionality difference. It's just the label that's been slapped on to say, this is the pool that's set aside for incentivizing this particular behavior. So you may have meant that question in a different way. What do I do with these coins? So if that's the case, the answer is, let's say I want to store 100 gigabytes on Dropbox. Today that'll cost me about $100 a year. It's about a dollar a gig to store my 100 gigs on, on Dropbox. But what if I told you you could buy $10 worth of storage coins and they will store that same amount of space, 100 gigs, for an entire year. And there's nice user interfaces to drag and drop your files on and off this system. Maybe it makes sense. And in order to access that system, you have to use storage coins. And people will build user layers, right? Users won't necessarily understand all this. They'll just know that it's cheaper, and they'll take some Bitcoin or whatever their preferred cryptocurrency is, and they'll buy this storage space, and in the back end, the program will switch it out for storage coin, and they'll be buying storage coin to earn that space. And those coins will then go to the network for the folks that are providing that space. And so that's sort of the loop that you create. People are earning these coins by providing this space. People are buying this space. Uh, in order to get access to that storage. And so that's sort of the, the circle this is ends up going. You see the same thing in Bitcoin, right? People mine Bitcoins by providing security, by providing confirmations of transactions. They can then, most of the miners, right, they either hold onto them or they sell them onto the network. People buy them off the network and I want to transfer a million dollars from here to there. And so I buy some Bitcoins, I send them over the internet, they get everywhere, wherever they need to go. And then that person, again, can continue through the cycle. So it's the same idea. It's really the same idea. Cool. Other questions? How are we doing on time so far? We've got time for one more. One more? OK, just one more. Great. Jack, I want your best question. I'm going to put you on the spot. Wait for the mic. So you've got like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. Jack is the gentleman in the brown coat. Yes, Firefly style. So one thing I think it's great about the Bitcoin, just the, right here, okay. One thing I love about it just is everything is open source with Bitcoin and monetization obviously is more difficult. And I see a lot of people doing, like kind of like what you're talking about, where you you know build the incentive mechanism inside the, this new coin structure. Um, right. What do you think of like using like more like a WordPress model where it's open source, but you still have kind of you monetize on the user level by making it really consumer friendly? So people who are hackers who want to set it up for their company, they can do it themselves. But then you have, you know, a, a public user facing brand that may not it's not going to be as decentralized. It's not going to be as secure. You're still going to have some of the problems of the legacy network, but at least it gives people a way to an entrance into the system and then also gives them like WordPress a migration path away from, you know. So could I, sum up the, could I summarize the question by saying, what about the model 
where I just open as an open source and then I monetize on top of it. Is that, is that a good way of summarizing the question? That's a fair way? Okay. So I'm perfectly open to that model, um, but not for the protocol. So like you said, you want something that's global and that's sustainable and will forever have Bitcoin because there's that incentive for miners at a minimum to earn transaction fees even after the block reward for discovering new Bitcoins has disappeared, there'll still be that uh, transaction fee. And so that creates a sustainability for the underlying model. Um, I think that's really important that you have that monetization built in. Open source has really sort of been using that model that you're describing uh, for a while now, right? That's how Linux works, right? It's released. For those that are tech savvy enough, they can install it and configure it themselves. But you have Red Hat on top that can provide enterprise services and help those that don't necessarily know how to use it. But I'd rather leave the underlying infrastructure incentivized and let people build enterprise stuff on top if they want, sort of like a Coinbase. Coinbase charges, you know, 1% after you've done a million dollars worth of merchant transactions on their platform. I think the 1% kicks in around there. Um, but people pay it because they're willing to pay for convenience, right? Because they've got a beautiful user interface. You don't have to be tech savvy. It just all connects up. But the underlying protocol um, is sort of ambivalent to the type of model that's built on top of it. And so I think it's really important that we incentivize the underlying model and we build it in a way where it's going to really have all the resources it needs to function in the future. So Tor is another good example of this. We talked about it earlier. People right now contribute um, you know, their nodes to the Tor uh, network, but it's stayed small as effective that, right? I mean, there are altcoins that have larger you know, node networks than, than Tor, which is really incredible considering the importance of the project, the global scope, the millions of people that use it, it's really lacking in incentives and it's lacking in that, that juice to really supersize the network. So I think this is an important distinction. It'll be an experiment. I want to clarify, and I, I do want to put the caveat out there, I don't believe this model works for everything. I'm not proposing this model works for everything. I will not defend that this model works for everything. It doesn't. I haven't figured out how to do small open source projects that aren't affected by network effect. Like, I don't know how to use this model for that. But for things where there's big networks built on top, things where there's a lot of infrastructure that gets put onto the, this platform, and where the first mover and network advantage is really important, that I think we can use this model for. So it'll be interesting to see all the experiments that get done um, and how far we can push the envelope with ways to use this model. So. That's why I'm really excited about it. I really appreciate you guys being an awesome audience. Thanks for everything. Happy to talk afterwards. Thank you.